Hey, Jeremy. Hi, Karen. <laughs> so where did this idea for the symposium come from? Well, the, the idea for the symposium came first from the idea of wanting to have Ian come in. So obviously we have a, a long history, and I, as soon as I took this job, I said, at some point, I'm going to bring Ian in. I have to have that happen. But I needed to get to the point that we had all the funding in place, that the sure. studio was in a good place, and everything and it was ready. And I felt uh, a couple of years ago, I said, I think this, I think this is... It's time to have Ian in finally. Mm -hmm. So we talked about it, found a date, and then, okay, he's gonna come in for a several day residency. What's he gonna do? And then, so that's where the idea came to, to sort of have this uh, one day event that's centered around Ian, but it's like, okay, but Ian's not gonna do everything all day. Sure. We also wanna, we also want to showcase what we have going on at Vanderbilt with the students, with me, uh, with Roland, with the Nashville Symphony section. And so it just became the symposium. Uh, through that but it was kind of based around having Ian in and then the idea came to have a one-day event awesome so let's talk about your relationship because you guys have a very interesting dynamic um, do you want to give us some <laughs> some background some history um, yeah I first heard Jeremy on an ITF competition on a, one of those blind judging competitions where you get sent a lot of CDs and you have to and um, I was instantly struck with, when I look back on it, it's, it's an amazing thing in life where you've, I mean, it's quite a lightning strike to listen to someone in a competition and think, you know what, I think that person will win the second trombone job in the Vienna Philharmonic audition. It's going to happen in five months from now. But I really got that feeling. It's very strange. It was like, hang on, that's exactly what we've been looking for. That's exactly what we talk about. And I was... Um, utterly convinced that this person was European because it had a European sound, European articulation and was really suitable and I decided, so I contacted the organizer of the festival and said, um, you know, who is number five? I can't remember what number it was, but who is number, and he said, well, first of all, we're in Brazil or something and, <laughs> and so I can't tell you even if I was allowed to, but this is highly unprofessional, this is a blind competition, what do you think you're doing? And I said, well, and I explained why. And he said, well, I can't tell you until I get home anyway. And his wife, Jan, said, it's Jeremy. Vern, it's Jeremy. And Vern said, no, no, it's not, it's not Jeremy. And, Vern, and Jan said, I bet you it's Jeremy. He got home. And, and, he, and, it was he, and he was teaching Jeremy. He hadn't worked out that it might be him. So um, that was kind of how the relationship started. And um, Jeremy came over a few days before the audition. We'd had some, exchanged some MP3 files. I had no idea what an MP3 file was at the time. <laughs> but, um, so you saw, that was the first thing you taught me, you know? Um, I'd only just stopped using faxes at the time. And, um, and so we did a bit of coaching by that. And um, I remember he came in, he was due to do the student audition. And um, Hans Stroker, the, the bass drummer player in the Vienna Philharmonic, listened to Jeremy with me. And Hans said, you know, this is, he's too good to play in the student audition. We should put him in the main audition. So we talked to the rest of the section, and they, were they said, okay, right, if you guys think this guy's so good, put him in the main audition. And sure enough, you know, Jeremy won the audition. It was one of the few uh, totally unanimous auditions in the Vienna Philharmonic while I was there. Everyone was totally agreed. So that was how our relationship started. And for me, it's been uh, fantastic, fantastic to see... Um, I know, I, I, once, I once said you were a bit like Forrest Gump, and you didn't like that, did you? <laughs> I'm really upset. I really upset you. But, and I really didn't mean that in a nasty way or in any way. I know he comes from this neck of the woods down yeah, here. What I meant were by that was your kind of like natural naivety. I mean, you mm -hmm. went into Vienna, Vienna, you had no bloody idea what was happening at all. That's right. You had no idea what you were letting yourself in for. And yet there was this sort of like sort of naive goodness about what you were doing and the open mindedness to learn. And and it wasn't easy for you, you know, and um, I think over the years we were both there for each other in the difficult times. And um, and so so that was how our relationship started. And for those five years, we saw each other more than we saw our wives or anybody else's wife. <laughs> so Jeremy, how does it feel to have someone like Ian talk this way about you? Yeah. Like, tell me, but like, no big deal. Well, even now, thinking about the story or hearing the story recounted, um, it still feels surreal in a lot of ways because it's so different from how I planned my life to go. It's so different from how most people get into a position like that. And um, I mean, it feels good. It's it's flattering. It's um, 
but it is surreal, you know, because uh, when all of that was going down, much of that happened in, in a blur. You know, I was just trying to stay the course and survive. And then when I got to Vienna, it was much of the same kind of feeling, just trying to survive. And, you know, it's my first orchestral audition. It's my first job, just trying to keep the job and survive, uh, you know, politically and socially and learn the new language. And besides that, try not to, you know, play a big note in the middle of a rest, learning to count rests, which I never really did really well, <laughs> did I? <laughs> Actually, you know, I have to say, when that, before you came, all the time I had a little old guy sitting next to me, you know, playing mm -hmm. in the Vienna States Opera. And I never had to count because he'd been doing it for 40 years and he used to go, three, two, one, now. And all of a sudden you were sitting next to me and I had to count. So, so that was, but just, I think I'd like to straighten one, one point there, just in case anyone's wondering about the audition process where, you know, I kind of heard this guy on a CD and I decided he would be the next second trial, and so it was. I just, I, I remember halfway through the audition, there was this one candidate that was really way out, far above anyone else. And we were all behind a curtain. And I was really disappointed because I, I, I kind of would have liked Jeremy to get the job and I was utterly convinced it wasn't him. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, I thought, I mm -hmm. thought no, that, that's somebody else. Don't know who that is, but it isn't Jeremy, it's someone else, you know. So there was no, you know, so that it, it was, it was, it's very interesting when you sit behind a curtain, sometimes you don't even recognize your own students. You know, mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. you've been working with in a room for years, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, you have no idea who anyone is, you know. Um, and uh, as far as, I remember there was something once said on the internet, there was something dubious about it, because I'd coached you before the mm -hmm. audition. And there were 16 people in that audition, 14 of whom I'd coached. Mm -hmm. And the <laughs> other two I hadn't coached because they never asked. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there was, there was no sort of foul play or anything like that. And like I say, I didn't know it was you. Yeah. Well, it, it, and, and it was really interesting to see how the relationship developed over the course of my time there. Uh, because I really needed a friend in the orchestra. I needed someone also who spoke the same language and could help me <laughs> with kind, the language kind, barrier. Kind, kind of the same, kind of the same language. Roughly the same language. <laughs> uh, and, and could, you know, could bridge that language barrier. Mm -hmm. um, and so we ended up just spending a lot of time together. And, and um, also Ian has this really great talent of knowing uh, what people need to hear. Mm -hmm. um, and there were times, there were a few times where I was really homesick or really unsure about, you know, my place in the orchestra. Or if I'm, you know, am I doing a good job? Am I, okay? you know, am I okay? I'm, you know, uh, especially in that first season. And uh, I remember several times where he would just like, you know, hey, we're glad you're here. You're doing a good job. He just knew exactly what, what a person needed to hear. And, and so that, that mentorship grew into a friendship as well. So um, both of you, you know, have played obviously in the orchestra and are pedagogues and solos and clinicians and all of that. Um, how do you find time to differentiate the different kind of animal that you have to bring to the game and um, just stay true to yourselves and you know your beliefs? That's a heck of a question. <laughs> <laughs> that's really that's really a difficult. If you're not up to speed on whatever you're about to do, you can get caught out very quickly. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's it's really it's really tough. You know, being being the pedagogue when your mind's on the performance you've got to play in five days is also not great. You know, dividing those things up is tough, and finding the balance is tough. Um, I tend to try and block my solo performances into certain parts of the year, so I know that over this three months, I'm just going to be digging the road, practicing three hours a day, and and you know, concentrating on that. And then there are other times when I know, okay, this is the time I really have to dedicate to the class, and 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 try and break it up, but there's one that you missed out there, and that's you know how you switch all of that out and be at home with your family. Yeah. That's the hardest one, I yeah. think, you know, yeah. because that affects how you do the job as well. You know, if you don't get you know enough recreational time with your wife and kids and and time for yourself and uh, good lord, <laughs> <laughs> are, are you all right? <laughs> I think I think that. Uh, Fried chicken seems to be doing the trick, doesn't it? <laughs> Jerry, I think one of your dinner guests just exploded. <laughs> Sorry, that, that toilet's really loud. Sorry. Ah, oh dear. Oh, okay. Right, well, that's buggered that, isn't it? Yeah. Who was that? <laughs> Who was it? It was Grant. Yeah. Is he swimming? <laughs> <laughs>
Anyway. There you go. So yeah. what are your thoughts, Jeremy? Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So how do you um, <laughs> balance the you know the coach, the pedagogue, the soloist, mm-hmm. clinician, and like Ian stated, you know, yeah. being a husband and um, being present for your kids and all that. For me, that balance is still. Uh, I'm still trying to find it, and it is it is one of the hardest things to to figure out how to be that that person and all those and wear those different hats and be those different roles at the different times and prioritize them. Um, I, I'm still in the midst of changing the way I schedule my lessons or changing the way I schedule my practice time to maximize not only the amount of time but the quality of time that I have with my students, um, with myself practicing, and with my family because. Um, we had this frustrating moment a few weeks ago where it's like, you know, I've, I've, I've sorted my life out so that it really should all fit in 24 hours yeah. and I should be able to get my practice done, get all my work done, see my students and give them my best and also be home and, and, and it just wasn't working, but it was mainly because I was doing the wrong things at the wrong part of the day, using the different times of the day for, for, for the wrong things and I'm, I'm still sorting that out. Um, what I'm trying to do now is get into that place where I can, everything is planned out, everything is prioritized so that when I'm in practice mode, I can truly just be that. When I'm teaching, I can truly just be that. And and hopefully I can leave all of that at Vanderbilt and come back down here. Yeah, that's the hard thing. And yeah. that's, that's the hard one for me. It helps that I have a long commute because of traffic, so I have time to decompress and, and, uh, and process some things before I step in the door. But that is one of the big challenges. Yeah. For me, for sure. Mm-hmm. So both of you having been in the industry for a long time and um, just going through different phases in what you've done and your growth as artists, where do you see the trombone itself heading in the next five to ten years? Uh, <laughs> I think I think where I hope that it's headed or where I, where I, where I see hints that it's headed is being taken a little bit more seriously as just an instrument rather than uh, rather than a novelty, rather than the sort of slapstick humor at the back of the orchestra or we play really loud, but actually people seeing how versatile the trombone can be. Mm-hmm. And I, I think first trombone players have to realize that they, they don't belong in the box that so many people have built for us. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you have to believe that that box isn't there anymore. It's almost like learned helplessness, where when you've when you've hit a barrier so many times, even when the barrier is removed, you don't realize it's not there anymore. And I think what I see with, with myself and with my students is there's there's like this ceiling that we're tempted to hit that doesn't even exist anymore. Right. I don't think. Mm-hmm. And just realizing like we we can we can have a lot more credit in the industry if we're willing to actually then expect that of ourselves. I, and I'm just as bad as anybody at, at self-deprecating, and I'm just a trombone, you know, uh, or it's just a trombone, but, uh, and, and that's just a part of our culture maybe, just the humor of it, but um, I think expecting that we can do more and better things. So I, I see, I see the, 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 the era of the specialist trombonist, I think, is coming to an end. Where I just do orchestra, I just do jazz, I just do whatever, I just do studio work. I, I just don't see that happening. Uh, it's already that way in a lot of ways. I, th- I see that solidifying where um, a trombonist just has to be a musician uh, of all kinds. And of course, we all have things that we're better at or, or not as good at or things that we like more than others. But I think the, the, I think the breaking down of barriers and borders is maybe what I see. Mm-hmm. Anything you want to add? Yeah, I think where the trombone is in the future is dependent on us, what we do now, the decisions we make now mm-hmm. as trombones. I think we're at mm-hmm. quite a, a critical point. Um, I think, like you said, I think what has, what has brought us to where we are now has served as well. Um, certainly in Europe, it's a slightly different atmosphere or attitude towards soloists or instrumental soloists in that it's about the soloist, not the instrument. There mm-hmm. is a bit more of that philosophy. Yeah. And in order to be that soloist, you have to develop a personality. You have to be, it's somebody, it's a person who has something to communicate that an audience can relate to, can, is appealed by uh, and, and attracted to. And um, I think that's a mistake that trombone players make, that we're too mm. um, obsessed with our instrumental, or in some cases, musical competence, and not actually being the soloist, you know, yeah. the, the classical soloist. 
The other thing that I think is desperately um, important is that we, um, well, a very crude way of, of putting it would be we don't roll around in our own muck too much and continue to play Arthur Pryor. Mm. And, you know, I mean, as much as I love playing Arthur Pryor, there's nothing wrong with it. But that we start, like you're saying, we start moving into different artistic areas. Mm -hmm. You know, we start trying to move a little bit more with the times and updating. I mean, if you go back 150 years, trombone players were playing new repertoire the whole time. It's just that was written by Ferdinand <laughs> David or, or whoever, you know, that, that was new at the time. That had to have been new ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that we need to be constantly trying to find the new repertoire. Yeah. Uh, but the instructions that we give the composers are important, that we don't then give them the mm -hmm. David Concerto and Prior as a reference, <laughs> that we try and have a different artistic view um, of where we could could take the trombone but it is we we're at a difficult point now because we could like a, a we could turn into a star trek star trek convention where we just it's trombone players playing for trombone players yeah. mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that that's great but it would be really nice if we could break out from that and make it more of an you know an artistic thing i'm going to stop now before that toilet flushes well, because that toilet has got he's actually giving the best commentary on what I'm saying <laughs> the, the whole time so, so. <laughs> okay so let me ask you a couple of fun questions um, that I would just like to know um, what is your favorite stage that you've played on since both of you have played with you know the best orchestra in the world anyone I don't know which one for me it's still the music frame I'd agree with that I think yeah there's nothing like it um, it's a it's a transcendent experience. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, those Sunday morning season concerts, you know, with the sun streaming through the windows, and it was like a religious experience. Absolutely, yeah. you're right. And when I did uh, the concertos there, you know, the, you you stand there, and it's, it's, it has the feeling of like you're in in someone's sitting room because you've got audience here and here and here, and it doesn't mm -hmm. feel that big. Actually, it's not that big, but you have such a contact to the audience. Yeah. And and apart from anything else, if you sound bad in there, you have a huge problem. That's right. <laughs> you know? it, just, it sounds yeah. fantastic, yeah. And, yeah. and the history yeah. that's there, yeah. and like you said, the the connection. With the audience, it's mm -hmm. like it's like playing in a giant living room, mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. know, uh, and and they're, they're, you're surrounded by by the people, and they're up close and personal. Um, it's it's just I've never experienced anything like it. I mean, Carnegie's great, Concerto Bell is great, mm -hmm. all that, but it's there's nothing like the music front for me. Yeah. Um, what is the favorite city that you've traveled to with the orchestra? Sorry. The best fun I ever had on tour was in Amalfi in Italy with the London Symphony Orchestra. It's not really a city, but there's a festival down there. Uh -huh. And have you ever been there? Yeah. Amalfi? Mm -hmm. It's like at that time, I didn't know anything that beautiful existed in the world. You know, <laughs> these mountains going down to the sea, and it was just perfect. But that's kind of was answering a different question. But that was, we had a great time. I loved it. It was great. So beautiful, you know, and the weather was nice, and, you know. I always refer to the trip to Australia. Just, I, I, I love oh, traveling. Awesome. I had never I had never traveled out, traveled outside the country except one other time before I got the job in Vienna and then we started traveling all over the place with the orchestra mm -hmm. and it just I, I found out that I love to travel and I love places that when you arrive they're exactly like you think they're going to be New York City has that vibe Italy has that vibe when you step off the plane in New York City you go it really is like on TV I mean it's exactly what you think yeah. and for me um, growing up as a kid Australia was like the furthest place. You know, whenever Bugs Bunny would tunnel through, you know, he might come out in China or he might come out in Australia, something like that. It's so far away from home, and uh, and it just it felt like I'm really in some totally different place now. And then you step off, and it's like there really are kangaroos hopping around, and people really do say "g'day, mate." And it's it's it was just fantastic. I loved every moment of that trip. That was my favorite trip with the orchestra. Okay, so final question: Both of you are foodies. So, what is your favorite food? <laughs> Pigeon de Bresse with a bottle of 1919 Rue Saint Georges, Les Saint Georges. Pigeon de Bresse, that means like a baby pigeon from the Bresse region of um, France. Awesome. I still stick with my chicken and dumplings. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you know, I I can't narrow down to a favorite food, so I just go with one that has an emotional connection as well, and I just, I love chicken and dumplings.